Alright, in case you haven't been following along, uh, in the last video, I kind of went over how the first step of the you know targeting chain is going to work. And in the, that case, it was a line trace type target log. And uh, in this video, we're going to go over the dot locking target process here. So let's go ahead and start out with... Um, you know, what is what is dot dot product lock you know, or dot product in general? So let me go ahead and I'm just going to put a hotkey out here. I've got a little saved uh, node to you know demonstrate what I'm talking about. So um, when I hit four, you know, obviously this isn't a valid actor. It's only going to react to pawns. Uh, that's what I have this set to. So the more straight on my my character is with the um, <clears throat> with the target. If you notice, it'll read closer and closer to one. Whereas um, if I turn my character, let's say 90 degrees, hang on, man, I got a cough. Sorry about that. Um, you know, if I'm turned 90 degrees and I fire the same trace, it's going to read zero or close to it in this case. And then if I'm turned around completely and I fire, it should read negative one. So it's a good indicator of directionality. And uh, if I return 45 degrees from the target, then um, it should read something, you know, a little different. Uh, it's hard to tell because of the stance and posture of this character, but you know it should read a different number, and on you know varying scales of you know one to negative one. So that's that. Uh, we don't really need to worry about it that anymore. And so in here, uh, you can kind of ignore this branch here. This is for some kind of future implementation. Uh, because technically, if it already hard targeted, it would have never made it to this page at all. It would have never made it to this page. So, um, yeah, so it, this is just for some future use, like in case something um, hard changes a value and of something, uh, maybe you got some kind of, you know, little cutscene that isn't quite a full cutscene that just kind of makes your character uh, pan and target to something, you know, some event that's occurring. You know, something like that. That would be used for something else. So again, we come in, uh, we clear our array just to make sure that nothing had been stuffed in there in the meantime. Uh, we're going to do a sphere overlap actors because, for a lot of reasons, because um, a lot of the times you'll see people using functions like, you know, uh, get all actors of, you know, class or type or, you know what I mean. Um, it's extremely inefficient. Uh, let's say you got hundreds or thousands of, you know, actors in some level and of that class type or whatever. Um, and you, you run this, it's going to have to go through and do all these, all this math for each character there. So why not just, you know, and half of those, 99% of them could be way out of reach. And so it's not realistic to, um, to, to use a, you know, get all actors. Now for something small where there's only going to maybe, maybe be a handful of enemies ever in a level, yeah, get all actors would, would probably work fine. But this, this is going to be more efficient. So this is going to give us approximately radius. Um, a minimum distance to enable. Uh, I actually need to change this because this is a radius and this essentially, you know, uh, never mind. The 600 is right. Because technically when you're doing all the other types of targeting uh, and you're using 600, you're still doing it from a radius. So, um, never mind. Had a brain fart there. Uh, this enumeration here is again just filled with um, you know, pawns. You know, we don't really need anything else in there. So, and then ignore the self. I don't know if it automatically ignores the self. It's just good, so, uh, good, good housekeeping to do that. So it comes in, compares, and says, um, "Do we have any entries in there?" And um, if so, if that's true, 
then uh, we're going to go ahead and populate this. And then we do a reverse for each loop because I'll tell you why. It will bug out if you use a regular loop, um, a forward loop, because uh, I don't know why. It's just it's it's dumb. It's uh, this works better. So it takes all these items. Let's say there's five. It'll loop through this five times in the loop body. And then once completed, it'll go through here. So what it's going to do is it's going to check the dot product value of each target here. It's going to get that uh, dot product, the horizontal dot product, not the actual um, product, you know? Because uh, a regular dot product would count like vertical up and down too, but I, I'm only interested in the, you know, XY plane there. I'm not, I don't care about the Z plane. So it's going to check between you and the other actor. And it's going to compare it with um, the float. In this case, you know, 0.5 should. Uh, if I recall correctly, I could be really horribly wrong about this, and I'd have to double check. But I want to say that you know a value point five would mean that you are 45 degrees offset from being you know from looking at them, which would be both sides. It'd be both left and right. So it'd give you a 90 degree cone, and uh, so it's going to compare those. If it is less than that number, meaning that it's closer to zero, which means that you are more perpendicular, like if here's the target up here, and you are more per perpendicular, it will be closer to zero, and then definitely if it's negative at all, it will um, remove that index. And then uh, it's going to do that, it's going to run through all of them, and then you're only going to be left with the ones that are um, that fit this criteria. So then it's going to come in when it's done, it's going to do a branch and it's going to say, hey, do we have anything in the index? If we do and it's greater than zero, then go ahead and, you know, target, uh, dot product target it. So, um, hang on one second. All right, I actually realized that I uh, made a little bit of a goof up there because... Um, what it was doing was it would it would only remove the ones that didn't qualify in that you know comparison check here. It would remove them and then it wouldn't you know sort and filter for which uh, index was um, the one that you wanted to you know mess with or not mess with uh, play with. Sorry, I'm kind of confused still. I'm getting back in with this. Um, so I had to come through and rig up this, which this is actually wrong and backwards because right now I've got it set. I need it to be greater than instead of it's backwards because I copied this from another part of the tutorial. Um, but basically, it goes through and compares leftover indices to each other and whittles it down till it's got um, you know one entry. And in this case, it's you know comparing the lengths of the dot product. This can be done. I got to redo all of this over, and I'll probably um, post that at some t point toward the end. But for now, it works correctly because what it would do before is it would more or less just get whatever you know object fit into you know slot one, which might not be the actual closest dot target. And um, so changing it the system to do something more like this uh, will whittle it down to one entry to choose and it will be the uh, technically the largest entry which I, I still need to go back and fix this to uh, correct for that I think all I have to do is just swap these two wires so um, that will um, cause the dot targeting functionality and it'll trigger this to be true and it'll print it out and then it will return OK and in the event that any of these little things fail like no length in the the, the tar or in the array um, etc uh, there's all kinds of fail conditions that will fail this and move on into the next section so in the next part we'll talk about the uh, radial locking and uh, I'll get more into explaining this in that video thank you